We have a long way to go before all of humanity's basic needs are met. Now, you may think that ensuring access to clean water is a relatively simple problem. We've had the technology available for several thousand years, it's called a well. <coughs> but the fact that one and a half million people die every year tells us that this is in fact a very complex problem. And an important complicating factor is our current levels of development are not sustainable. John already uh, showed this picture earlier. I just want to point out that for some of these planetary boundaries, we seem to be in the green. For example, chemical pollution or maybe atmospheric aerosol loading. But if you look in the parentheses here, that's because we largely don't understand our impacts. <laughs> Certainly, we, uh, we're getting a better idea of what's going on with climate change. <coughs> but really, the thing that causes great concern is rates of biodiversity loss. Some people have proposed that we are in the middle of what could turn out to be one of the greatest mass extinction events in the history of life on Earth. Our current levels of development are not sustainable. And there's been a tremendous increase in sustainable development, in notions of sustainability, and that's reflected in the number of times that the word sustainable appears in English text. Uh, I'm showing it from around 1950 here, where nobody was really using the word sustainable, and it's increased many thousands of times to present day, now, if we were to continue on this trend, by 2036, the word sustainable appears, on average, every page. A little time later, it's going to be in every single sentence. And if we continue at this rate, by the start of the 22nd century, everything written in English language will be nothing but the word sustainable repeated again and again and again. Clearly, the rate of increase in the word sustainable is unsustainable. Now, you may think that the rate of increase is constant because it's a straight line, but actually, if you look here, it's not a linear axis. This is a logarithmic axis. Every value here is 10 times greater than the previous one. And when you see this kind of linear log plot, it's telling you that you're looking at an exponential function. The reason we use a logarithmic plot to show it is because if you try to show this on a linear linear axis, you wouldn't see any of these values here because these values up here are so much greater. You see nothing, and all of a sudden, you see a great increase in the value of the function that you're looking at you would see something like this. This is the world population over the last 12,000 years or so. And you can see for most of that history, you can't even see the numbers, because then they're orders of <coughs> hundreds of thousands or millions. It's only been the last couple of thousand years, in a particular last century, in the last few decades, that there's been this tremendous increase in the global population. If Homo sapiens are around a million years old or so, it took about a million years for us to reach our first billion, but thereafter, our rate of increase has increased. There's been a tremendous increase in the last 20 or 30 years. In fact, during this period, the world's population doubled in a little over 40 years. As well as this tremendous increase in the numbers of people, there's also been a tremendous increase in the amount of energy that our global civilization is consuming. I think it's a quite remarkable statistic. Take the 200-year period, so around the middle of the Industrial Revolution, around 1790, and up to uh, 1990, a little over 20 years ago. And imagine all the energy consumed in that period. Every piece of firewood, lump of coal, barrel of oil, volume of gas, and then electricity produced by nuclear fission uh, or renewable resources. All that energy we used, again, in the 20-year period since 1990 to 2010. And that is what this energy looks like over an historical context. And again, you can't see most of it because the values are so very low. Because for most of our history, we were limited in the amount of work that we could do in our muscles and in the muscles of our animals <coughs> that might pull a, a plough or pull a cart. It's only been the discovery of high-energy fossil fuels, <coughs> high-energy density fossil fuels, since the Industrial Revolution, the discovery and the utilisation of coal and oil and gas, that there has been this tremendous exponential increase in the amount of energy that the global civilization is using. Currently, it's around 15 million million watts, or that's about 15 terawatts. It's most probably more like 16 terawatts now. And this is largely powered by fossil fuels. Now, of course, the only thing we can say with certainty is that these fuels will run out. They are a finite resource. And the question is, what are we going to replace them with? And there's much debate and discussion, and it's a controversial subject, the notions of peak oil. But in a historical context, it seems reasonable that this tremendous increase will be matched with a tremendous decline in our consumption of fossil fuels, as we will get hold of them as quickly as we can and we'll use them all up. So what do we replace them with? Well, I guess the current um, assumption is there'll be some kind of mix of renewable power, renewable resources, wind, wave, tidal, solar, geothermal. But there's something fundamentally wrong with this picture. It assumes that this tremendous increase in energy that we've seen over the past few decades suddenly stops and that we collectively decide that we've had enough energy and that our energy use will remain constant 
for the foreseeable future. <coughs> when you're looking for the load that, or the requirement that you want from renewable resources, you should be most probably looking at multiples of our current energy use, perhaps five times as much energy. And of course we have no idea how we're going to do that. We don't have the science, the technology, we certainly don't have the infrastructure in place to be able to produce so much renewable energy. So there's a question of timing here. We don't seem to have an awful lot of time to think about putting in place the alternatives to fossil fuels in order to keep the lights of our civilization on. But arguably, there's a much more important reason why we should be transitioning away from a carbon-based economy. Uh, this is a map of temperature deviations. There's an average temperature here. It's the temperature between 1950 to 1980. And if a region is dark blue, it's about two degrees cooler. And if a region is uh, shaded uh, in this red colour, it's about two degrees warmer than this average temperature. And we see temperature changes uh, from around the end of the 19th century. Now we've known for quite some time, theory has told us, that if we increase the amount of carbon dioxide in the Earth's atmosphere through burning fossil fuels, you increase the rate of forcing in the Earth's climate, you increase the amount of heat, and we would detect that increase in heat by, in observa by observing increased temperatures. And indeed, this is what we see. So, the increase in temperature, that's locked in. Even if we have to instantaneously stop emitting any kind of carbon dioxide right now, because of the residency time of CO2 in the Earth's atmosphere and other processes, we would still be locked into a certain amount of cooling. Now, by the middle of this century, by around 2050, we're going to start seeing some significant impacts of climate change, and we also could be seeing the greatest number of people who have ever lived. If project projections are correct, by the middle of this century, there could be another eight... Uh, there could be in total eight or nine billion people. It may increase, hopefully it will stabilise and decrease. So we have the element here of a perfect storm. By 2050 we're going to have to be producing at least 50% more food, at least 50% more water and at least 50% more energy. Depending on who you talk to, this could actually be multiple. So it could be two or three times more food, water and energy that we currently produce. And somehow we're going to have to do all that at the same time, it's actually <coughs> decreasing the impacts that we're having on the planetary system. If our current levels of development are not sustainable, how are we going to be able to do all this additional work on the Earth system without making it any worse? Well, that's the starting assumption or the starting question for this new undergraduate module that we're running next year called Global Challenges. It's a very ambitious module. It's got some big questions it wants to ask. And at the moment, 80 students have signed up to it, and it's going to be largely delivered by um, eight guest lecturers and it's going to look at factors such as population pressures. And you may assume that population pressures are largely responsible, or at least a kind of a sufficient explanation for why there are issues with food security or energy security. But it's important <coughs> to remember that the majority of food, the majority of energy, is consumed by a minority of the world's population, people like us, people who live in industrialised civilizations, And that there are close relationships between food security and energy security over 40% of corn grown in the United States now doesn't feed humans, it feeds cars via biofuels. And as fuel prices go up, food prices go up, fuel prices go up, the two systems are tightly intertwined. The University of Southampton, as we've been hearing about tonight, is a world centre in ecosystem services, and we're going to be talking about that. How do we value natural capital? But financial systems as well, human systems, social systems are important. We live in an increasingly interconnected global finance system. You know, the global crash of 2007, 2008 shows us that events on one side of the world can profoundly affect events on the other. <coughs> and if we want to get a handle on global challenges, then we must be substantially <coughs> with governments, transnational governments, you know, going beyond um, the nation state as the paradigm by how we self-organise ourselves at a global scale. And again, we need to think about how all that happens under the ever-present uh, consequences of climate change. So these are important big questions. And it's innovative in content. It's also going to be innovative, innovative in the way in which we want to run the course. We're going to get students together in multidisciplinary teams, and they're going to pro progress through the course together. One thing that employers of our graduates tell us is that they, they love the fact that our students are very um, specialised, they know their field very well, but they want students to be able to reach out outside of their particular discipline and talk to other people who may not have any idea what they're going on about, may not have the same kind of background. So, for example, if you take a random student who asks, what does a philosopher look like? They may say something a little like this. It's kind of an old guy with a beard who talks in impenetrable sentences. If you ask again another student, what does a computer scientist look like? Maybe it's something like this. 
someone with a fetishness for technology and maybe an inability to talk to non-binary systems. And if you are to ask um, a computer scientist or a philosopher, what does a, maybe a natural scientist, a biologist look like, they may say something like this. It's a guy, sometimes with a beard, almost always with glasses, wearing a white coat and looking at things really intently. <laughs> so from an employability point of view, it's our responsibility to try and equip our students with the best kind of suite of skills. But arguably there's a much more important reason, and it's an intergenerational responsibility that we've got. Our students, the young people alive today, didn't cause these global challenges. They didn't over-pollute and over-consume or put in place the policies which have led to um, us imperiling the very systems in which we all rely on. But they're the ones who are going to have to live with them. And if future generations are going to survive and prosper, they're the ones who are going to have to fix them. So it's our responsibility to try and give them the best um, start in which they will need in order to address these challenges. And then going beyond our students um, and members of staff within the university, we want to reach out to our local community. And so we propose to run a TEDx event um, around March next year. Some of our more eminent academics here may be asking, who's TED? Well, it's not who, it's what. TED stands for Technology, uh, Education and Design. And it's something of a global brand now. They run events kind of like this, but they typically last all day. But they are very broad in scope. Some, of, some TED and some TEDx events uh, attract thousands of people, and you will pay thousands of dollars to attend them. But some are much more grassroots level, and this is what we're proposing. So sometime around March, we'll have a full day of people talking about essentially sustainability. What's Southampton contributing? It's university staff members, it's students, but also people in the local environment. What are they contributing to notions of sustainable development? If you'd like to learn more about Global Challenges module and the TEDx event, uh, please do check out these uh, URLs. And thank you very much. I've finished. <laughs>